you open your Bibles to the book of Romans, we're in a series called Justification by Faith on Sundays. Paul began a discussion on justification by faith in the third chapter, verses around 19, and goes through the fifth chapter, The book of Romans was an enormous book for the Reformation that affected America, your life, and my life. It swept across Europe and into America by such men as Martin Luther. This was the book that changed his theology and his life for Christ forever. Justification by faith. I came... I chose to do Romans 4 and 5 off from a study of the life of Elijah because I felt it was, there were a lot of similarities between the drought that the nation of Israel is going through and uh, the COVID that we were going through and how it affected beyond the nation. It's true for America. And... Uh, <clears throat> As I view it from Elijah's point, it looked like what he was going through that God's intention was because of a declining nation spiritually, his effort, they were getting, they had gone from sin into deep evil. Our nation has, sin is the least of our problems in America today. We're into evil. I mean, we're into evil up to our eyeballs. And um, uh, God fights evil. You know, if you take the word devil, drop the first letter. You, f you understand where evil comes from. Huh? Evil. And uh, God wanted to bring a spiritual awakening within the children of Israel of what was going to come their way. They were into divine discipline, the cycles of discipline upon the priest nation of Israel. And he has to bring them to a spiritual awakening to do a, a spiritual reformation to get to address evil so that we can come back to the issue of sin, which comes from Adam, not the devil. Now, see, evil was present in the world when God made Adam and Eve. That was their problem, wasn't it? Well, anyhow, so uh, coming out of that, when I closed that session down, what I thought was enough evidence of what we, where we needed to be as a church and as a nation in America, and it would be my advice to other nations, that we should uh, deal with a reformational idea that comes from our cultural background of Western civilization and the Reformation would be the Book of Romans. And uh, I didn't want to teach the whole book, so I took... took a, what I was after was justification by faith. And so we're, we're studying Romans 4 and 5, and we're looking back and forth to Romans 3, where he makes a great plea that justification is by faith, not works. Because if it's works, then it's wages, and you get what you're due. And if it's by grace, then it's a gift. And faith brings grace. Faith in the right object brings grace, and grace is a gift, brings a whole idea of gift. And so that's where we are, and we're in Romans, the uh, fourth chapter today, and I'm going to look at verse 13 because I thought I should stop because this whole thing, chapters 4 and 5, he goes back to Abraham where justification became a great doctrine. And it... Uh, from uh, and, and in the old covenant, the old covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant uh, is all about justification by faith. Abra the Abrahamic covenant. Listen, the Abrahamic covenant 
is so important that it functions today and will function all the way through the millennium. Think about that. The Abrahamic doctrine, the Abrahamic, what we call the Abrahamic covenant. Because the, the, a lot of the Abrahamic covenant will not come to completion until the millennium. And, and Paul is talking about the Abrahamic covenant as an important covenant to the church under the new covenant. It was an important doctrine to the old covenant. It's an important doctrine to the new covenant, justification by faith. And so we've been, we've been studying justification by faith out of the book of Romans. Two books deal with this, the book of Romans and the book of Galatians. The fourth and fifth chapters of Romans, third and fourth chapters of Galatians, dealing with the Abrahamic covenant and what we should learn from it and how effective uh, the Abrahamic covenant is to our theology under the new covenant as well as the old covenant. So we're, we're, I thought I better stop because sometimes I assume that we know, might know more than we know just because I've been teaching so long. So I thought I ought to go back and we ought to look at the Abrahamic covenant a little bit uh, to get an understanding of where it's found in the Bible and where we should look, we should study to get this. Now, the Abrahamic covenant is going to come out of Genesis. It's going to begin with chapter 12. And it's going to go through of importance to chapter 18. He's going, the Abrahamic covenant is going to be developed. It's going to start in 12, and then it's going to start being developed and it's going to get developed. And by the time we get to Genesis uh, 18, we will have the Abrahamic covenant pretty well developed. So that when you get to chapter 22, the Abrahamic covenant is a really important covenant when, um, when you have... Um, Isaac offered on the mountain. Very, very important covenant. So those 18, the 12, a lot of discussion in 12 and 15, 17, 18 on the Abrahamic covenant. So I'm going to look at the foundational structure of the Abrahamic covenant, which comes out of Genesis 12 today. But... I'm looking at Romans 4.13. Uh, and so I'm going to stop today. I'm going to read 13, and then we're going to look at the Abrahamic Covenant today so that we can get back into Romans and ever be on the same page when we talk about the promise to Abraham. In verse 13, for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants. Now, you see, the, you're talking right now, from that point of standpoint, you're talking 12 through 15, and then you're going to get from 15 to 18 when we get into descendants. So what, what the writer is assumed that you have studied Genesis 12 through 18. Because when he says, when he says, for the promise to Abraham or his to his descendants, watch this now, that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, because the Abrahamic covenant was 430 years, the Mosaic covenant, after Abraham's covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Mosaic law. <clears throat> that he would be heir of the world, not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Watch this now. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So, you know, he assumes that you have read <laughs> Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, and then went on to read 16, 17, 18. You got to know that background because Paul talks now like you know that. So we're going to look at a little bit of that as we go along because I'm, you know, probably a lot of you have never looked at that. And the Abrahamic covenant is so important 
that it worked. It worked under the old covenant. It works under the new covenant, church age, and it will go all the way. Listen, the Abrahamic covenant will not be completely fulfilled until the millennial age. The Abrahamic covenant is an enormous covenant. Look at he's teaching it to the church in the book of Romans and Galatians. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to take a look at the Abrahamic covenant. I'm going to show you how God introduced it uh, to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through two, 3. He's going to introduce it, uh, and then he's going to develop it over the course of the... Uh, look. Look up here. <laughs> Listen to me. Let, let, me show you the, let me show you the time scale. Let me show you Genesis 12. In the life of Abraham, Genesis 12, he, he, he gets converted. And God lays on him uh, his, his doctrinal will for his life. And it involves a covenant with God, a covenant, a covenant that God has made with him. When you get to Genesis 12, Abraham is, 95, uh, is 75. When you get to the 18th chapter, he's 100. That's 25 years. Agreed? Now, I'm not good at math, but I can probably, I can probably handle that. You know, what that, you know what that 25 years was about? Now, listen, you know what that 25 years is about? It's what it's about in your life. That 25 years is 25 years in your life that God wants. Now, I don't know if you've given it to him, but he wants it bad. The first 25 years of his life, he was teaching Abraham the word of God so that he could operate, he could operate by the will of God in his life. Instead of flop, flip-flopping all over the place because he doesn't know the word of God, it, God sat down and began to school him. Just like Jesus did his disciples, he began to school him. Over the next 25 years in his life, he schooled this man. And because of his willingness to sit under the teaching of the word of God, he developed the capacity that God could use in marvelous ways. That's true for your life and mine. If you're not willing to sit down and learn it, you won't get to live in it. If you don't learn it, you won't live it. And it takes time. You got to learn a little bit more and apply it. You got to learn a little bit more and apply it. You got to learn a little bit more and apply it. And at some point, you're going to have the spiritual capacity where God can use you what his original intention was for your life. And there's not one person in this room that God doesn't have a, a, personal, a personal interest in your life. Just as much as Abraham. And Paul teaches you that in Romans. But are you willing to log it? Are you willing to log it? Are you willing to do this 2 Timothy 3rd uh, chapter 16, 17? All scripture is God breathed, inhale, exhale. Are you willing to put inhale the word of God and then exhale it in a proper way? Are you willing to learn the faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God and then walking it out in your life. Are you willing to do it and walk it out? Listen, you're not going to grow unless you, unless you use That little fat baby you got, you want him to start walking, don't you? Isn't it interesting as soon as he starts walking how he thins down, becomes healthy? Stayed on milk, look what he'd be. 500-pound little baby boy. You got to understand this stuff. You got to invest in the Word of God so that God can invest it in you. You can do the work of the Lord. Can't do it without the Word of God. Can't do it without the Word of God. Can't do it. Why don't you put yourself in a place where you can study the Word of God and grow in the Word of God so the Word of God can use you in the most powerful way?
It took 25 years in the life of Abraham, just going through the, the everyday mill of life, of, of the difficulty and the struggle of, uh, of learning and applying. You know, faith comes by hearing, hearing, believing, believing, applying, applying, completing, and now you're growing. So let's have a word of prayer and get into Abraham's life in the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest and dwelt by the Holy Spirit. What a privilege you live and I in the church age in which the Holy Spirit indwells us and is willing to teach us and recall what he taught guide that information in our life, disclose to us not only the things that are present, but the things that are future, not only in our life, but the, the, the life of the kingdom. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, we come to you today, and we're so thankful for your grace that has provided all the facilities for us to meet in a grace gift way. I pray today, Father, that we would understand the importance of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour, both for hearing, believing, and applying. It's an enormous principle of inhale. If we don't inhale, we don't exhale. If we don't do either of those properly, we die spiritually from malnutrition, if for no other reason. I pray today the Holy Spirit would energize our life to understand the importance of the Abrahamic covenant to the church age. All the way, all the way, and the importance in the life of a believer all the way because of the principle of justification by faith all the way to the millennial reign. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you look at your paper, we're going to do about four four points this morning. Let me go back to my verse 13, Romans 4, 13. For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. The promise to Abraham is what I'm looking at. The promise to Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant, point number one, the Abrahamic covenant was a grace covenant consisting of six promises that are given and recorded under the Old Covenant to Old Covenant believers. They will be pertinent to the New Covenant believers all the way to the Millennial Age believers. The Abrahamic Covenant. I want you to go to Genesis with me and get to the 12th chapter, first book in the Bible, and go to the 12th chapter. There's a Bible, if you didn't bring your favorite one with you, there's one in the pew for you. If you don't have a Bible, you may take it home. Now, I want you to pay attention to something that's really important that we miss. It's the little things in the Word of God that we miss that, that I think are really important. For example, I want you to pay attention to the words, I will. I will. Roll, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Genesis 12. And I want you to just take a look at that. And, and, and identify, before I start, identify the I will. Like in verse 1, verse 2, there are two. Actually, there are three when he says, I will make. Three, I will. Two times and I, there he says, I will. So I, I, I'm going to show you. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Abram, that's, his name is going to be changed later in the A Abrahamic covenant due to his spiritual growth. He's not going to change his name until he spiritually grows. And when that point comes, when he changes his name because he has reached 
spiritual maturity, and he's now ready to really develop him uh, for what he ha- his, the plan of God has go- called for his life to be. The Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, remember that's the Ur of the Chaldees, from your relatives, that all of that's discussed in this 11th chapter of Genesis, if you want to know where he came from and who his family was, from your relatives and from your father's house. And so he says, I want you to go forth. Now, he lives in the Ur of the Chaldees in a pagan, and, and his entire family, according to Joshua 24, 2, are pagans. They worship false gods. They're, they're into polytheistic belief system. And so, and they're all there. And so he's going to bring them out of that. So I want you to leave that mess. I want you to leave. I want you to leave your country. Watch what he's asked him to leave. Leave your country. They were of the Chaldees, the Chaldean. That was his, col- his country and his culture. It's where he made his living, a good living, if you know the story. Your relatives, your relatives, and your father's house. as a patriarchal type of system. A patriarchal system, that's where you get to patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, patriarchs. And so he's asked him to do, what he's asked him to do is really difficult. And and, and Abraham, if you study If you study the 11th chapter of Genesis, you'll see how difficult it was. He moved from one part of the country to another part of his country before he could finally leave the country and his relatives and his father's house. And listen, God was patient with him. When he said, go forth, he meant, let's let's do it now. But God, God, sometimes, you know, it depends on your spiritual growth, how much, is he, how much he push you, like parents. Depends on where your child is in his growth and maturity and yada, yada, at least if you're a smart parent. And so he lets him take a little time to digest this stuff. Then he tells them, okay, now it's time to go. And uh, God allows a death in the family to to be the the last, the father, the last that he asked him. He left his, quote, his country. Not really, but he moved from where he was in the country to another place where he wasn't as well-known and prominent. And his relatives... And then his father. When his father died, the, the, his true father, the father of heaven, that's the one you will all, that will always be your father and will always be your father in time and eternity. That's a marvelous idea. The fact that God calls himself father is an enormous idea. But you probably don't pay that much attention to it. You should. I don't know that you do. And so his father died, and then God reminds him, now I want you to go to the country. And he doesn't tell him where. I just want you to go forth, and I'll show you. So here, And so he, he, here's where we are. And he says, to the land which I will show you. And so I've listed on your paper the I wills as promises. There are promises in here. There's six promises. Now, usually we only pay attention to the three major of the promises. We, we pay attention to the land, the seed, and the blessing. But there are actually six. And they're really important to biblical history. 
And so I want you to be sure that you're aware because this Abrahamic covenant goes all the way to the millennium. That's why you should be familiar with it. Go forth. Go forth to the land, watch this, that I will show you. Now, I want you to get this. Now, listen to me, because you're going to have to write this down. God says, I will show you. That's the will of God from a God side of it. Listen, most of the time he reveals his will so that you will receive. Not my will, but thy will be done. That's not here. Here's the promise. I will show you the land. I will show you the land. That's unconditional and it's grace. And it's God's side. See, whoever thinks about God's side of the will, we always think about God's will. What does God's will say for my life? I must do the will of God. Do you ever stop to think that as your heavenly father, he has willed things into your life? I will show you the land. It's not conditioned on anything in your life. It's conditioned on my character. I will show you the land. That's a promise. If you will go forth, say it's all the, if you will go forth, I will show you the land. That's up to God, isn't it? That's a promise. So let me give you one this morning. Now, I want you to pay attention in the Bible when you read it to when God says, I will. When God says he wills something to you, he wills it to you. So I want you to go to the book of John, the gospel of John, and the sixth chapter, and I'm going to go, don't lose Genesis. Now I'm coming back. I just want to show you when you see, when God gives you a promise, when he says, I will something. And so I just, I just picked one that, uh, an idea that people struggle with and they shouldn't. Jesus says, this is the will of my father. This is the will of my father. In other words, the Father says, I will. Do you understand that? Are you in John 6, 40? Okay. This is the will, this is a promise from my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. In other words, why did God send his Son into the world? To die on a cross, be buried and raised from the dead the third day. That's the... If you read the whole book of John, when you get to the end, you'll know that. We're at the beginning. Everyone who, be, who beholds the Son and believes in him, in other words, Christ is going to come. What's his purpose to come into the world? To heal people? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Not unless you're talking about spiritual healing. To die on a cross for the sins of the world. Adam sinned to be buried and raised from the dead to do what? To give eternal life. Look, look, look. What's the promise? What is the Father willed into the Son? What is the Father willed into the Son that if you be, believe in the Son, you get? This is a promise from God. It's not based on your character. It's based on His. It's unconditional. It's not in anything you do to get it, not anything you do uh, to keep it. It's based on you believing that God sent his son to die for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead third day. You understand that? 
who beholds the Son and believes in Him may have eternal life, and I myself will raise Him up on the last day. There's two promises, one from the Father and one from the Son. Get the two wills? The Listen, the Son says the Father has willed that if you understand why He came into the world to die for your sins, you know, and believe that, you get eternal life. Now I'm going to give you a promise connected to that. I'm going to give you an I will. I will raise you up. Right. You got two, haven't you? One from the Father and one from the Son. I say that's a will you can take to the bank. Why? Because it's not based on you. It's based on the Father. The Father will. That's the promise. That's a promise from God who cannot lie. You got to pay attention to those when, when, when God says, I will, or Jesus says, I will. That's a promise. It's, it's based on there. I mean, this is based on the character of the Father and the character of the Son. That's why it's unconditional and that's why it's grace. And what does he promise if you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised? What does he promise you? He promises you at that moment he will give you eternal life and you will always have eternal life because God's eternal life. Pay attention to those things. Pay attention to those things. I will. That's a promise. That's a promise from the character of God. See, when God says, I will, that obligates himself. Doesn't obligate you, it obligates him. Eternal life, he obligates himself. Listen, write this down, 1 John 5, 11 through 13. 1 John 5, 11 through 13. That's, that's, part, of, that's part of that promise. On the backside, that's the, John is writing both of these. He writes in John 6, 40. He answers it all in 1 John 5, 11 through 13. Just saying. And it, it's a promise from God. Well, that was in verse 1. In verse 2, and let me get back to Genesis 12, 2. I will make you a great nation. And third, I will bless you. It, God will make them a great nation. Now think about this. Think about this with me. He says that to Abraham. He renews his promise to Isaac. Isaac. He renews his promise to Jacob. That's the patriarch period. They go into slavery for 400 years in Egypt. God calls Moses in Egypt to lead them out. They spend 40 years in the wilderness wandering. Because they're too timid because they operate by fear and not by faith, they're not capable. Fear can't take you any place in the plan of God. Faith does. So they wandered 40 years, every, every so often getting a look as they passed by of what the promise of God had given them, but they operated by fear, therefore they never could get it because it operates by faith. Before Moses is able to lead them out of the land, God teaches him the Abrahamic covenant. If you studied Exodus, you would know that. If he was interested in the Exodus, right off the bat, within the first five chapters, you're going to see that Moses... God tells Moses, he sets him down and teaches him the Abrahamic covenant. And he said, this is what you're going to operate on. So when you question how you're going to get out of 
400 years of slavery, entrenched slavery, you're going to have to look to the Almighty God. God Almighty. El Shaddai. God Almighty. That's what overcomes fear. God, we, listen, our God is Almighty. I don't know how am I going to... God Almighty, I don't know how am I going to... God Almighty, I don't know. God Almighty, God Almighty, God Almighty, people. My goodness. Sit around and whine and suck your thumb and whimper. And you've got an almighty God ready to execute his almighty power in your life. What is wrong with us? And we can't believe that. Where is our faith? Well, what's he promise? He promises, I will make you a great nation. He tells Moses on the, on the traveling in Exodus 19, 6, he says, we're, gonna, we're going to call it the priest nation of Israel. God is so patient. God is so patient with us. Look at all of the years. Even Moses didn't do it. It took Joshua in a period in the Bible called the conquest where they could find enough young people that had the faith. to watch God do the impossible things in their life. Their parents couldn't do it. They cowered. They cowered down at the very thought of having to fight to occupy a piece of property. Well, so Joshua, Joshua leads them in. We're talking about the promise given in Genesis 12. We're all the way over the book of Joshua before it gets done. God is so patient. He is so patient with us, looking for people, looking for people, people that are willing to grow and take the time to grow and develop and be honorable with what they know to be the truth of God's word. He's looking for a, f a few good people that are willing to take his, his word seriously, that will trust him to do unbelievable things when he promises them to you. Well, he's promised to make them a great nation. And you know when that's going to come? Listen, that's a promise given in Genesis 12. You know where that's going to come? David. King David. Now we're into Samuel. We're in the book of Samuel. We're in the book of Samuel. And God is still on the throne. God has still promised. He is still the father of promises. What's he looking for? He's looking for people that has, has his heart, that has a heart for God. And he found a young teenager with a heart for God. He trusted God to kill the bear and the lion and Goliath. God is so patient with us. And we're not with him. Isn't that, isn't that nutty? We're so impatient with God. Well, you promised it. I want it now. That just tells you're a baby. That baby talks that way. I just had that experience over the holidays with people in my home. Well... As an adult, you kind of try to correct the behavior a little bit and go like, well, you know, they're, they're babies. Yeah, they still have to be. They have, still have to be. 
taught a little bit, you know, the, the babies have to be the babies, not the parents. Well, anyhow. Here's the third promise. I will bless you. I will bless you. You don't have to gain the favor of God. You've already got it in Christ. The guy said to me, well, I don't see where God's blessing me. I said, say that again. He said, I don't see where God's blessing me. I said, I want you to look up now for a moment. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. You know what you just did? You inhaled and exhaled. You know, you've been blessed. You got air. <laughs> you got lungs. You're using them all wrong to complain to God. He hasn't complained to you one time. What's wrong with you? I mean, you don't have anything to be thankful for. My, my, my. My, my, my. He says, I will bless you. In the second chapter, he says, I will, I will make, it's insinuated, I will make your name great. I will make your name great. And so you shall be blessed. Now, he said, I'm going to bless you. He said, but there's another. I'm, gonna, I'm going to make your name great. And because of that, blessings are going to flow through your life or to your life. Abrahamic covenant. All this is in the Abrahamic covenant. Five, in the third chapter, verse three. Watch this now. People don't take this. They don't understand. This is a promise. I will bless those who bless you. Now watch this. And, I w and the one who curses you, I will curse. That's anti-Semitism. That's an anti-Semitism clause in the Abrahamic covenant. We understand that. The reason they call it anti-Semitism is that that's where it came from. And, and it's Jewish. But listen, it's more than that. Because what we're going to find out, that the you in this is Christ. It's not just the Jews. It's all those believers. It's all of those believers in the prophetic gospel of Jesus Christ, whether they be Jew or Gentile. You say, how would that happen? We'll read Matthew 1. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ, you will find some unbelieving women who gave birth to messianic seeds. Right? Rahab, Tamar. Come on. Yeah, what did I say? Yeah, gen I meant Gentile women. I didn't mean unbelieving women. G Gentile women. I will bless those who bless you. See, we take that to mean just Jews. But this is not because, listen, this Abrahamic covenant is still operational in the church age and will go all the way to the millennium. He's talking about those in Christ. Those in Christ. Jesus talked about it. See, we, we take it one way, and that's okay. It's okay to say that that's Jewish. It's certainly part of that. But it's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. It includes you. The sixth promise is really important. The sixth one is really important. It's in verse 3. And in you, all families of the earth will be blessed. You're going to see this become a really important principle in Genesis 22 with Isaac. Well, what's going to happen if I kill the seed? So I want you to go to Galatians with me. I want you to see this. This applies to Christ. This is why all of this is important to you. The Abrahamic covenant is important to you a lot more than you think it is. Let's say I get to the third chapter of Galatians. 
third chapter of Galatians. I'm looking at six. Oh, Paul is, is, in a, in a, is talking law versus grace in the third chapter. In verse six, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Right? So we're back in Genesis, aren't we, in the Abrahamic covenant where about about 15.5 or something, something like that, 15.6. You, you got a study Bible? You got a cross-reference? 15 what? 15.6. Yeah, see, 15.6. See, Abrahamic covenant, we're working working ourselves, trying to get the full Abrahamic covenant out by, by, the, by the 18th chapter of Genesis. Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned or credited to him as righteousness. Therefore, all right, we always pay attention to the word therefore. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. Huh? Not just a Jew. Look down to verse 20. Look down to verse 29. Let, let, let's look at 28, 29. Look, look at same chapter, Galatians. 28, 29, there is neither Jew nor Greek, or Gentile, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, and if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offsprings and heirs according to the promise. That's the Abrahamic covenant. All right. Let's see, let's, let's go you are all there by faith. You are sons of Abraham, and the Scripture. Watch this now. Foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, "All nations shall be blessed in you." Got a cross reference Bible? Wait, you got a cross reference Bible? Then you got Genesis twelve three. 12, 3. So how are all the families of the earth, now called nations, how are they going to be blessed? In Christ. Right? Because the seed of Abraham is Christ. And all of this is pertaining to Christ. All of the Abrahamic covenant, the key factor is Jesus Christ. Historically, Christ before, Jesus Christ now. Let's go to Acts. Let's go to the third chapter of Acts. And it's interesting. Look how the Abrahamic covenant is affecting your life in the fulfillment in Jesus Christ. Third chapter, Acts. I'm looking at 24, 25, 26. Now, if you've got a cross reference Bible, you see, you can study the way I'm just teaching. You know, you go to one, you go, I wonder what that is. You look cross-reference, you study cross-references, this is how you learn. And likewise, all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and his successors onward also announce these days, it is you who are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with your father, saying to Abraham... And in your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Look how they translated that. For you first, God raised up his servant and sent him to bless you by turning every one of you from your evil ways. My, my, my. My, 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 people. Wowie. So well, here's what's interesting. We look at this. Abraham had Isaac, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. Now we got a dilemma because the Abrahamic covenant is about the seed, not seeds, Galatians 3.16. And he wasn't talking about seeds. He was talking about the seed. Of Christ. You understand? Oh, gosh, people. Give me a break a little bit. 
Man, I've been pounding Galatians 3.16 forever. Now, I, I, apparently I'm talking to internet people is what I'm talking about. Look, we got 12, we got 12 tribes. Out of Jacob, he has 12 sons. We got 12. They turned into 12 tribes. Agreed? Yeah. I'm not asking for consent here. I'm just, I say that just to, we should be all on the same page. He had 12 sons. They became the 12 tribes of Israel. Only one tribe was selected to be messianic. Only one. Judah. Agreed? And in that tribe, only one house of lineage, David. And in that one house called David, two people, Joseph and Mary. And in that one woman, Mary, God, the Holy Spirit, would plant the seed, Son of God, to fulfill the Abrahamic covenant. Merry Christmas. You think God is not concerned with details? <laughs> I mean, right down to it, any. And that's true for your life. It's true for mine. You should just be so thankful for what God is doing in your life, stirring it up, whatever he's doing in your life, however he's stirring your marriage, your family, your business, your job, whatever he's doing, it's all for good. Every bit of it. You want to bring joy to the heart of God? Take every aspect of it seriously by the word of God and put the promises of God into that thing and see God Almighty do impossible things. Right down to the minutest of detail, God is concerned about it in your life. I mean, he might even care what kind of toothpaste you use. I don't know. I'm just trying to get to details. Isn't that interesting? You know where all this came from? Abrahamic covenant. How important is Jesus Christ in all that? See why the devil was so stirred up with him? When he dies on that cross, he thought he had victory. He's so stupid. Devil's stupid. Why would you follow him one minute? You talk about, he lives in a ditch. Why do you think you're not driving in the ditch all the time? That's, that's, his, that's where he lives. He's a cesspool guy. Why would you go run with him like that? Talking about one seed. Out of all these descents, the descents as the stars of the heavens. And God is looking for one seed. Now, as a farm boy, that seed can be really something. One seed. We used to have to, in grandmother's garden, we had to plant three to get one to grow. And when the three grow, then we had to go out and weed them. <laughs> we had to take two of them out. <laughs> one seed. One seed. And you know how God sees you as one seed of importance because every person in Christ is one seed. He said we're one in Christ. And you are important. Don't let the world, don't let your family, don't let the world, don't let your neighbors, don't let the school tell you that you're not important, that you're a dummy or you're this, or you're that. Don't listen to that. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Listen with the Bible. Listen to how God brags on you. 
Listen to God brag on you. If you listen to God brag on you for a hand, and you could if you read the Bible, he brags on you all the time in the Word of God. I'm in the Acts, so let's go to Romans. I, I, about time to go anyhow. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why I write things out anymore. I have a great idea in my office. When I write down, how many points did I say? Four. <laughs> Do I ever get through with these? I don't know. I have 421, one of my favorite verses. It's in, in, this, it's in this, uh, I mean, I said Acts, I mean Romans. Acts, but I will, I, listen, I'm, I was in Acts, what I? I'm going to stop in Acts. I want to go to Romans, but I'm in Acts 4, and this is part of the Abrahamic covenant. Listen to this. Verse 12, there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which they must believe. One name. I mean, we're down to one name. One seed with one name. Huh? There is no other name. And that's all. Okay. Out of the Abrahamic covenant. I'm after Romans 4.21, one of my favorite verses, and it comes out of this section of the Abrahamic uh, discussion. 4.21, pay attention to the word promise and be and being fully assured. He's talking about Abraham and, and, and chapter 18. You know, ver, look up at verse 19. He's talking about he's 100 and Sarah's, they're both sexually dead and all that. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? You talk about God Almighty. <laughs> He's 100 and she's 90. And he says, okay, we're going to have a baby. How can that be? Why, you couldn't, you, there's, there's no way that that would ever make any kind of sense at all if it wasn't for the word of God. He's still working on the Abrahamic covenant. H has nothing to do with him. Right? It has everything to do with them. Well, we're, we're, she, she goes, I've been in menopause for you. Wow! Think about that. You go to the doctor, I got this, I feel a little bad. I have something wrong with me. I, I don't know, I must have ate something wrong. And he goes, like, well, You're three months pregnant. You go, like, wow. I'm 90 years old, doctor. How old is your husband? 100? Oh, my goodness. Right? Now everybody's getting suspicious. Imagine, imagine how that family's talking. Where, have you, where has she been the last three or four months? Can you imagine that? Just like, just like Mary. And being fully, 21, and being fully assured that what he had, being fully assured, there's your faith. Being fully assured, that's your side of the, God has promised me, fully assured, fully assured. I'm not doubting. Because God said it, God, listen, it's, it, he's obligated himself to me. Fully assured means that God is, I, I understand God said this is my will, and therefore under the grace principle, unconditional grace principle, God's obligated himself. And being fully assured, fully assured, and being fully assured that what he had promised, he's talking about the Abrahamic covenant, he was able to perform. He was able. God, he's God Almighty. He's El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. Well, I want you to go ahead and look on the rest of this uh, on your own. In Romans 4.13, Paul introduced the subject, heir of the world. Heir of the world. heir of the world. I wonder when that'll be. I wonder when that will be. Listen to me. Millennial age. Because the God of this world won't be there. He'll be in bondage for that thousand years until the very end. Well, anyhow, 
it, it's just interesting. It's, it, it, this is stuff that you need to study, uh, and I would encourage you to do it because I only, I only got an introduction to it. I never, I'm not coming back to it. I got to move on. I say I'm not. Uh, what do I know? Uh, I may. Depends on whether God wills it. But if he doesn't, I won't. But if he does, I'll be back to the subject. But, you, but listen, I laid it out. You need to really understand the Abrahamic covenant. And you need to be familiar with it because it's in your life. In Jesus Christ. That whole, that whole Abrahamic covenant is part of your life. It's part of your period of time on earth. It's part of the period of time that you have on earth in it. Well, let's, let's have prayer and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way today by the automobile and the internet. I pray, Father, that those uh, on the internet would understand that they can pull down uh, notes off the internet at doctrinalstudies.com and, uh, and, and finish this lesson because I only got, I really only got through point one. Because that's all we needed today. And so I thank you. Boy, Father, we need to understand how all of this works in our life. Uh, make it as simple for us as it can be made. And that will be done by the Holy Spirit's ministry to teach and recall. I am confident of that. I am confident of that. In Jesus' name, amen.